unit is all about learning. So we'll talk about behaviorism and then a little bit about social learning or observational learning. So before I do this, I want to do a quick recap so we know where we're at as far as uh, the history of psychology goes. So there's a couple there's a couple changes in psychological thought. So up till about mm, the 1890s-ish, well, we'll say 1870s. Um, psychology was all about the fact that humans are essentially blank slates and that all of our information and knowledge is based off of sensory information we take in and then our, our perception of that. So we're blank slates and that sensory information can input uh, shape us. Uh, is that a nurture or a nature uh, perspective? Nature. <laughs> I'm hearing such an even split. All right. Humans are born essentially blank, and then we are shaped as we grow by the uh, information we take in uh, and process. Nurture. Nurture. There we go. Cool. From the uh, 1870s till about the 1920s or 30s, I will say 1920s. I will say 20s and 30s. Um, it's going to be different, and then it's going to be different again uh, until about the 1960s. And here it's going to be a bit more of an even mix. We'll talk about it uh, later on. But what's going to come next between the 1870s, 1820s, and 30s? So I'm going super nurture here, um, being a blank slate, going all the way back to John Locke, uh, which was a good thing because um, that, of course, got rid of all the caste systems that placed you in a certain class and kept you there forever. Uh, they said, no, you, you have all this potential, so we shouldn't limit anybody, you should have natural rights. That was all wonderful. Um, ultimately, the view wasn't correct, but he was right that we should all have a chance because we don't know our potential. Okay. Uh, and then what? The pendulum swung the other way. It started to favor nature. Why and how did it start to favor nature? We haven't read this in forever, by the way. So I'll be mad at you for uh, forgetting this. This is uh, social Darwinism? Yeah. This is where social Darwinism had a big impact. What's social Darwinism? Like evolution, survival of the fittest. Okay, that's just evolution, survival of the fittest, but that, that's just Darwinism. What what distinguishes um, the, the what's the distinguish between the two? Distinguish it between the two. Society. What? What is a fine society? How? Like if someone is powerful, they have a right to be there, and they have a right to. There we go. Okay, cool. So it erroneously applied uh, Darwinism, survival of the fittest, to social structures. All right, so these were guys that believed, oh, if I'm super rich or wealthy, or I'm a powerful uh, person in this, in this particular class, or I'm a nation that's particularly powerful, we are better individuals or peoples because we are genetically superior. Like we're smarter or better or hardworking, and if you're poor or not doing well, and you're able to be exploited, that actually it's because uh, uh, you're inferior, you're less intelligent or you're lazy or, or whatever. Right, so they basically justified, how can we phrase this, uh, hierarchy <laughs> with uh, biology, which is definitely not quite correct, especially when they apply it to whole groups of people, saying like, oh, Europeans are superior because they have better economic systems and militaries and things like that. All right, we know that that's just, they had the access to other cultures and they used it first that way it happened. Um, they weren't like genetically superior. What else? That, okay, that's a, that's a bad view, but doesn't mean anything bad uh, is happening. Obviously, imperialism is happening. That's not good. But that already happened. This was their justification for it. They take this a bit further, though. All right, so they say, oh no, we already imperialized, and it's okay because we're superior, and that's fine. And uh, uh, w working class people have to just you know suffer what they suffer because they're inferior. Um, what did they start doing that was? actually taking this to another level and was actually very, very, very damaging uh, and wrong and terrible and, and all that. Oh, wait, oh, I was going to say, like, they're, they take it to the point where they started, like, looking at that aspect, like, for individually, but then that's not it, but then starting to push themselves. That's true, though. They, they do apply, and I already mentioned that, but it's worth mentioning again, they apply that group lens to everybody, uh, even though we all know in certain populations, individuals uh, can be uh, anywhere on the spectrum of uh, uh, highly gifted and whatever, highly intelligent whatever category, um, and they apply it to the whole group incorrectly. 
Uh, but uh, what, what do they actually start doing in some of these countries that is uh, a, a major violation of, of individual rights and, and natural rights, which is why that's a bad idea? Well, genocide. Okay, like what? Uh, you have the Congo lease in the Congo. Yeah, we've had genocide before. Why is this genocide different? Well, it's because it's a genocide is out of, how would I say it? I don't have the words to say it. It doesn't do genocide. We've had genocide before, though. This is a different type of genocide. It, it, it's almost like a scientific genocide. Well, pseudoscientific, meaning it's definitely not real, but. So, okay, so I was gonna say the Holocaust because um, they particularly targeted them because they were Jewish and because they believed yes. that they were. Yes, so that's the ultimate yeah. uh, example. Yes, yeah, so you have uh, certain policies leading to things like the uh, Holocaust, right? Uh, where uh, uh, the Nazis adopted this policy of social Darwinism where they thought that all non-Aryans were inferior, so they need to like get them out, and in some cases eliminate them, right? That was the worst example, and it's totally uh, uh, worth mentioning. This is why people were so terrified to ever take a biological explanation for people. That's why they went like from this to this to, oh my God, never this again, because it's gonna equal Hitler again, which is obviously terrible, but. Is that eugenics? Yeah, this is where they, uh, eugenics leads to, ultimately, uh, or contributes to uh, this Holocaust. All right, cool. And if you forgot, eugenics is uh, basically, it's kind of like breeding uh, in that they were trying to take characteristics they thought were good and promote people passing those genes on and stopping others who they thought had inferior genes from passing theirs on. So they would target people like uh, re uh, repeat criminals. They would target them and, and like sterilize them. Uh, or people who are mentally or physically handicapped, they started to, uh, 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 not euthanize, they were just killing them. Um, Come on, brain. What's it called when you take somebody's ability to reproduce? Sterilize it. Oh, I couldn't think of that word. Yeah. I did already? Well, I already forgot it. I didn't sleep well last night, so my brain is not at maximum capacity. But um, regardless, yeah, so they uh, were sterilizing criminals uh, and uh, handicapped peoples against their will. And then, of course, you all know the ultimate example of actually eliminating races because they thought they were inferior and competing with them. So that was a really... At, the, at least at the time, a valid scare for people like, whoa, God, we can't, we can't even go near this whole uh, 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 biology and psychology thing. We've got to go right back to the genes have no impact because otherwise this is going to happen again, right? Their fears were grounded in something real, but it doesn't mean that if you if include genes in the explanation that it, it's going to result in this. Uh, at least we know that now, but can't blame them. It did happen and it scared them. So we go all the way back to a new view, or not a new view, but a repolished version of that view. What view do we go back to where in the 20s and 30s, especially after World War II, the scientific and psychological community just totally reject the idea that genes and biology uh, affect your thinking and behavior? What do we go back to? Yeah, it goes back to a kind of blank slate type of uh, uh, a view. Blank slate. So the idea that we're entirely shaped by culture and society, uh, we are essentially these blank slates that absorb what's, what's outside and that forms us, uh, so there's no such thing as an individual. You're just a product of your culture, essentially. So this is where you get really uh, popular but completely wrong theories like social constructionism, where again, you are entirely shaped by your uh, environment. There's no biological factors in there. Um, uh, what else did they believe? Oh, you guys ever heard the noble savage? The term before? Okay. Um, nobody even said yes, so I can't even say, well, what is it? I'll just have to tell you. Uh, this was an old view that became very popular again. The noble savage was a term, I think Rousseau came up with it back in the Enlightenment, um, or during the age of Enlightenment. Not that Rousseau was much of an Enlightenment guy, but um, the idea he had was, such as blank slate idea, that <clears throat> people who didn't have civilization like society, like governments and rules and all that stuff, they were better off because uh, Humans were naturally noble. They would naturally live peacefully and non-violently. They would naturally live in harmony with their environment, not exploit people. And they would naturally have these happy, wonderful lives. And he thought that society was the thing that caused people to suffer and uh, fight and hurt each other and steal and have wars and things like that. Um, not correct, obviously, but that's what the noble savage is. Uh, and the, the, he actually coined the term because he said, oh, look at these uh, 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 primitive peoples and." and how much happier uh, uh, they are, and he, and he, he just, it's called an armchair, and he's called an armchair anthropologist, in that he was like, assuming how their life went without knowing anything about it. 
Um, he thought they were so dumb they didn't have like languages and stuff like that, which was absurd. But nonetheless, he thought society made everybody uh, uh, develop all their negative attributes. And that if you didn't have society, people would be these wonderful, you know, uh, 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 parading around and skipping and one, holding hands and helping each other out with no violence and, uh, and nothing bad happening. All right, so that's going to be a, a super uh, swing the other way. And then after the 60s, uh, it starts getting more realistic slightly. Uh, but what we're focusing on is right here for today. Because the dominant uh, field of psychology and view in psychology uh, was behaviorism. And behaviorism is like the definition of this. That I am 100% shaped by my environment and external stimulation. Uh, and that I shouldn't even look at the brain or thoughts or internal processes or emotions at all. All I care about is what society and my interactions, uh, how they shape me, uh, with, with no regard whatsoever to genetics or biological uh, 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 structures of the brain or the neurochemicals in the brain, none of that. Ignore it, doesn't matter. All we care about is what's outside affecting us. So, how does that sound as a, as a way to understand uh, human beings? Is that gonna explain how, uh, we, how and why we do all the things that we do, all of them? No. No, it's not. We'll explain some of them, though. Yes. It will, right. So while they're wrong that, they're, that it's all this, uh, they are correct that uh, external uh, stimuli obviously does have some impact on our behavior, right? If I have this impulse to murder somebody, what's going to stop me? Law. Law, right. Uh, there's a consequence for it, right? And, and I know there's a consequence for it. So our external world definitely impacts it, right? If I have this urge to kill somebody for whatever reason because they did something to me or my family member or whatever um, I'm much less likely to actually carry it out because I'm aware well there's police and there's investigations and there's prison uh, and there's DNA evidence and all these other things that uh, that are out there in the world that, that would come back to, uh, to to bite me right so they're definitely correct that it does affect it and that's what we're gonna talk about today but I do want you to understand that these guys during their period uh, their their height from the 20s to the 60s uh, that's why they thought the way they did, um, and they were incorrect in saying that's the only thing that there was, or even that that was the most important thing. But it does have an impact. So today we'll talk about uh, how they discovered it, and then of course how it actually has an impact. So, behaviors. Well, first let's talk about this whole learning thing, what it actually means. So learning, uh, the definition for it is actually any information or skill, info, slash skill uh, that is um, relatively enduring or long-lasting. Why, uh, why does it have to be enduring to be learning? It's like, so if you, if you do something, or like if you get something in your head, you're like, if you only get it once, you're gonna be like, okay, whatever. But learning is basically like knowing it for a very long time so that even if it's not said to you, you already understand the concept. Yeah, and you can use it. Yeah. Right, yeah. I didn't learn it if I forgot it, right? Mm -hmm. I could say I learned it before, I guess, but you're, you're implying by, by saying that that you, you no longer have it. So when I say I learned something, it usually means that it, it stays with me, right? Because you've, you've had a lot of information in your lives, right? You've had a lot of teachers, including just this class alone. I've told you hours worth of stuff. Do you know and remember all of it? No, you don't, right? You only learn some of it, right? So what, we, what learns has to stay with us so we can use it uh, usually, hopefully, to make our lives better, to avoid things that are bad, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, utilize things that are good, um, uh, and how to figure out how to negotiate and, and find out between those two. Uh, that's what learning means. So the enduring part's necessary because otherwise you didn't learn it. If you forgot it, then you didn't actually learn it because it's not staying with you and it doesn't actually allow you to to, uh, to, uh, to help out your, your, your own life and apply it. Okay, so the form of learning we're gonna talk about here is what's called associative learning or association. Because that's what behaviorism is all about. They are uh, convinced that everything I am as a person is based on my associations uh, with stimuli. All right, and I keep using the word stimuli, and I'm sure that's losing some of you. I mean any information coming in at all. It could be visual, it could be auditory, uh, it could be sensory. Um, I do learn things based on my senses, 
right? Uh, a kid who, uh, for the first time, sees fire, like on a candle or something. Do they know anything about fire? No, no they don't. What's, uh, you could tell them, uh, and that might work, but uh, what's one way for sure they're going to know that I shouldn't touch fire? Yeah, they're going to touch it, right? And so what, what are they going to find out when they touch it? That it, well, that it hurts, not that it's just hot. Like, oh, that's hot. Like, it's going to hurt them. It's going to burn them, right? So that's where they uh, learn this association. I could tell them, and that could work, right? You don't have to experience everything to learn it. Uh, but the stuff I do experience does uh, uh, help me learn and understand it. So again, the association means I know two things come in pairs. So in this case, I know touching fire comes with pain, pain right? That's the association. So two things uh, come uh, together or in succession, like right after the other, slash in succession. And there's a great example. If I touch something hot, the association is pain. Okay, that's important. Why do I need to know that something that's hot, like fire, is uh, painful? So, you don't hurt yourself. so I don't touch it, right. Uh, why is it important that I have the pain? So you have pain? Yeah. So you avoid doing things that are going to hurt you or kill you? Well, like, yeah. well, hurt me, that's just pain. What do you mean hurt me? Like, I like where you're going yeah, with that. Kill you or your yeah, body. fire could kill me. It could burn me alive, I could die from that, or I could get a burn and then my skin uh, is exposed, bacteria gets and I die of infection, right? That's. That's how pain has kept people alive and all the other animals that experience it over time. Uh, they form associations, right? So these things that are painful, I avoid them. And that helps me live in the case of fire or, or, or whatever the painful thing is. Another painful thing you want to avoid. Very sharp things. You want to be careful around them because it could cut you and then you, get a, uh, you could bleed out and die or you could um, um, uh, die of infection later. All kinds of things. All right. Okay. Uh, what are other associations that uh, you learn even without trying? That when this happens, this happens. If you study, you get <laughs> yeah, that's true. you're you're looking at that. That's actually a different thing called operant conditioning. But oh. and, and we'll get. There. I'm talking just like every time, this and this immediately. What's an immediate consequence? You guys can't think of one. Wait, say it again, maybe. You can, you can stick with the pain theme. Oh, okay, cool. Go. You stab yourself, it's going to be painful. Yep, if, uh, if something sharp pokes you, I mean, not many people stab themselves. But, I mean, they might do it accidentally. I was watching my, my eight-month-old yesterday, he was, like, pounding blocks together, and then he accidentally hit his finger with it, you know, and then he got to experience the pain from that one. He didn't do it intentionally. Yeah, so yeah, uh, touch something sharp. Uh, can equal pain, absolutely. So if I press something or fall on something sharp, I know that pain is coming. So what am I going to avoid doing? <laughs> yeah, pressing or, or falling on that, that sharp thing, or at least being careful with it. What's another association I know? Um, I don't know if it's like consistent, but if you yell at a baby, it'll cry. Yes. Okay, you're talking about the baby Albert thing, which we'll get to. That is an example. Yeah, if I, if I scare or scream at a baby, I don't know why you do that, but yeah, if, I were, if I were to have a, any loud noise, a super loud noise to a baby, pretty much every single time that baby's going to. Cry. Right, right. You scared it, so it, it feels threatened and it can't communicate that, so it has to cry. It's the only way to let its parents know that I'm in danger or I think I'm in danger, so you, you get the kid, right? So yeah, uh, loud noise for a baby equals uh, cry. Okay. What about other ones? Like, um, what happens if I, I walk into uh, my house and uh, uh, my grandma or your mom or whoever's cooking, um, you just smell something good? What happens every time? You salivate. Yes, you do. If you smell, even, actually, if you just think about eating something you like, you'll actually salivate. Why? That's an association, by the way. So if I sense food, I'm going to put sense because you can see it or smell it or think about it. Sense food, I salivate. Why is that happening? Because it does. Why? Because I smell, think, or taste, think about, or taste food. My, uh, 
I salivate. Why is that happening? Is it is automatic? I can't stop it from happening. You guys got nothing? People are weird, I don't know, they just drool. Like why, why do you drool? There's a reason why you drool. Yeah, no, 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 you're, that, that's just this. That's the sensation. You're either thinking about experiencing the, the eating, like you smell it, taste it, whatever. Yeah. Why do I salivate when I uh, sense food? Oh, you're anticipating it. Feels like when you salivate. You are anticipating it, right? That's, that's part of associated learning, right? Anticipation. Anticipation. Uh, you guys haven't given me the, like, the scientific reason as to why I salivate, though. That's definitely part of it, yeah. So there's like these like no for your brain that Yep, that has to do with it. <clears throat> so that's definitely part of it. You guys ever seen that um, uh, cinnamon spoon experiment thing? Uh, if you haven't, you should try it. Uh, you take a spoonful of cinnamon uh, and oh, then you yeah. eat it and you have to swallow it. On what happens every time? It hurts. Well, it does hurt because it, 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 it's like a spice, but. Why does everyone have it spinning out? It's not because it hurts, because people eat, people eat spicier it's stuff than that. It's dry, it dries your mouth out immediately, right? It just absorbs all your saliva. So what's, a sli what's saliva for then? Yeah, it's so you can actually uh, break down your food a little bit, that's true, but you wouldn't be able to actually get it down to your stomach without it. If your mouth is dry, you can't actually chew up your food and swallow it. You need the saliva to do that. Uh, so your body automatically kicks that in. If it thinks you're going to eat because you're smelling or seeing food, it'll kick in the saliva so you can actually uh, chew it, break it down a little bit, but mostly so you can actually get it down to your stomach. Otherwise, it's just going to stay in your mouth. Um, that's why some people who don't salivate enough or, or whatever, they always have to have a drink with their food uh, because they'll like eat and chew and then they, there's not enough to actually get it down comfortably, so they have to like drink a little bit and get it down there with it. That's why you usually drink while you eat to drive away. <laughs> Um, aside from just the fact you need water, and, and that also can taste good depending on the drink, but it actually helps you take the food in uh, with it. <clears throat> All right, so that's a natural reaction I can exploit. So there is a guy who discovers this, uh, and his name is uh, Ivan Pavlov, and he's not even a psychologist. He was a, I don't know if he's a gastroenterologist, but he was looking at, uh, uh, he was studying the, something about stomachs with dogs. I can't remember exactly what he's studying. All right, um, and he discovered something. He discovered that dogs always do something when they smell food. They salivate, right. Okay, cool. Do I have to teach dogs this? No, no they do it automatically. All right. So uh, he started using terminology to sort of describe what was going on. All right. So if I don't have to teach you something, you're not conditioned. Conditioning is like I trained you, basically, or, or not you, I trained you, but you're trained by yourself or others uh, to do something, conditioned. So unconditioned means untrained, essentially. So unconditioned stimulus. All right? So in this case, it's the sense of what? Salivating. Not the sense of salivating. That's not a sense. There's five senses. Wait. Like smell. 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 Okay, cool. Yep. So the unconditioned stimulus would be the uh, scent of food. Or you could just put smell. Okay. Dog smells food. You smell food. I mean, you mean dog. You smell food. Dog smells food. Um, and their automatic, untrained, or in this case, unconditioned response is what? Salivating. Salivating. All right. Unconditioned. So untrained response is, of course, going to be uh, salivate. OK, why don't I teach a dog to salivate when he smells food? What? It's a natural response. Yeah, it's a natural response. It's like it's ingrained in your, uh, in your DNA. Like, we all do this, right? There's certain things you're, it's an instinct, essentially. Uh, uh, we're all born with certain things that you do automatically without having to learn it. Uh, and this is a. Uh, sort of one of those things is the association that, that you automatically have. You automatically salivate when you think you're going to uh, eat food because, again, you have to be able to actually get it down to your stomach, okay? So unconditioned uh, means untrained. What if I go up to a dog, um, never met him before, 
Um, nothing, he hasn't been trained for anything at all. No training, he doesn't even know how to sit or anything like that. And I go up to him, uh, if I show food, is he gonna salivate? Yeah. Yes, he will, automatically, don't train him. What if I walk up to him, no training, totally untrained dog, and I just blow a whistle? What's he gonna do? Bark. Maybe bark, maybe. But is he, is he gonna salivate? No. no. I'm gonna blow a whistle and, uh, well, let me phrase it like this is perhaps better, because you're right, the dog might bark. Is every single dog in the world gonna bark if I go up to him and blow a whistle? No. no, they won't. But every single dog, unless something's wrong with them, is going to salivate if they smell food, correct? Yes. All right, cool. So this is what's called the neutral stimulus. This is something uh, that doesn't do anything at all. There, it, it elicits no uh, consistent response, all right? So it wasn't a whistle in his case, it was a bell. So if I go up to a dog, whether it's a whistle or a bell, it doesn't matter what it is, and I ring it or I blow the whistle, every dog is going to respond differently, all right? Because there's no association there. Do they know what comes next after the bell? No, it's just, it's just a bell. It's just random. It's neutral. It does nothing. So the neutral stimulus, in this case a bell, is uh, the response is going to be uh, nothing. It'll do nothing. Maybe it'll bark, but there's no you know, sequence that all dogs are going to respond to the same. Is there a way, though, I could get the dog to salivate when he hears a bell. Conditions. Yeah. Okay, you can condition them, yeah. How could I do that? Yeah, you give them food every time they hear a bell. Yep, that's what it's gonna be. You're gonna form that association, it's associative learning. So, I could do this fairly easily just by, uh, every time I feed him, I uh, ring a bell. So, and that's exactly what happens, uh, that's what he does anyway. Um, I can't remember if he did it on, intentionally at first or not, but he does eventually do it intentionally, uh, where he ring a bell and feed the dog. All right, so the dog is always, uh, eventually associates this, this uh, idea that, oh, there's the bell, that's the dinner bell or, or, or whatever. So he automatically anticipates food, and if you're anticipating food, you do what? Salivate. You salivate, right. Okay, so this is obviously pre-training. Pre-training. Uh, if, I, if I go up and, and use a bell or a whistle for a dog, they're all gonna respond differently, there's not gonna be anything uh, the same. But if I train that dog, condition them to associate that bell with every time there's food right after, pretty soon uh, it equals bell, uh, the response I get is gonna be salivate. I have to train them though. All right, so this is, uh, this is post training. All right, can I use these terms to uh, attach this? Can I go unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response to it? Why can't I? Because it's not, no longer unconditioned. Yeah, did I train the dog? Yes. I did, it's, it's been conditioned. Okay, all right, so what could I call these then? So this is, is this a, a stimuli or response, the bell? Stimuli. Stimuli, right, sound, okay, cool. So I've trained him, so would I say unconditioned stimulus, or what would I say? Conditioned. Conditioned stimulus, right. All right. And this would then be conditioned response. response. Yeah. Um, another term for like when they've learned something successfully, like when I'm successfully ringing the bell, the dog actually uh, salivates. It's made the association. That's called uh, acquisition. It means you've successfully trained the dog. Oh, acquisition. Successful training slash association. So before we take our break, I want to do another example. We'll do this exact same thing, but we'll do it with something uh, with a different um, uh, example. All right. I want you to. I'm sure you've all well, you've you've all heard the baby Albert um, story or little Albert story because we did a, an experiment analysis on the uh, ethics of it and how it was unethical, and then you also wrote your notes here. So what? In that scenario, so it's the little Albert experiment. This has been a long time ago, back before the uh, you know APA made all these uh, regulations and local review, institutional review boards would, would uh, approve these things or not. How could I take all of the info I know about the baby Albert or little Albert experiment and attach it to these terms: unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, neutral conditioned, and conditioned response? You don't do the whole thing, but do you know what any one could fit in, as far as categories? Some condition um, stimulus would probably be like the noise, like, like the animal. Okay, yeah, all right. So 
Yeah, let's get these up here. So unconditioned stimulus. I'm just gonna abbreviate, but it means the same thing. Mm -hmm. To unconditioned response. And I've got a neutral stimulus. So nothing. Um, and then, or at least nothing consistent. Uh, conditioned stimulus to conditioned response. So how could I, what, what it, I can't remember which one you said. You said um, I said um, the unconditioned stimulus is the, um, the noise of the animal. Loud noise. Okay. The neutral stimulus would be like the fluffy animal. Okay, well, let's finish this one first. You're right. Let's, so loud noise for a baby. What's the unconditioned response, the automatic one that a, almost every kid's going to respond with? Yeah, crying, right, so crying baby. And again, they do that because they're scared and they want their parents to help them out, but they can't say anything, so all they can do is cry. Okay, cool. Well, I gotta catch up on these Morgan bucks here. Uh, Vanessa's added a couple. Uh, James added a couple. You had one. That's all I remember on the top of my head. Oh no, and you had one too, okay. Um, all right, so then what's the neutral stimulus in the uh, Little Albert experiment? The, the fluffy animals. Fluffy animals, right, okay, cool. Seeing or feeling the fluffy animals. Right, if I show them a picture of or show them a, a, a rat or a bunny, babies are going to do different things, right? They're not all going to cry. They're not all going to be like, oh, like they're, just, they're all going to have different responses, okay? So there's no real distinct response. But, you know, if I... Boom, scare baby, loud noise. Almost all of them are gonna cry. That's the automatic, uh, unconditioned, untrained response. Okay, cool. So this is all correct. I like this, I like this. Now what did, uh, his name was Watson, by the way, that did this experiment, John Watson. He was a behaviorist. Uh, what did he do to this poor little guy? What? Every time they would show them a, a, a white furry character, a character, uh, animal, um, they would bang this, uh, uh, make this loud sound. So every time this kid saw the furry animal, loud sound would, would, would occur and he would cry. All right, so what's going to happen then if I keep doing this? Yep, that's exactly right. So how could I fool in this bottom part then? Because you're right, eventually he's gonna associate there's a, there, I see a, a furry animal, a loud noise is going to come. So what happens here? How do I fill this out? The condition of stimuli would be the, would be the bunny with the noise. Yep, fluffy animals. And then the condition response would be the crying, right? Yep, it would be the crying. Okay, cool. This should be, by the way, seeing, by the way. Vision is the uh, sense here. All right, so yeah. Uh, if I show a baby a fluffy animal, it doesn't mean that they're going to cry. Uh, some might, some might not. But if every time I show them the fluffy animal and I bang this loud noise, uh, they're going to cry from loud noise. After a while, after acquisition, successful, this is a terrible thing, but after I've successfully conditioned the child to uh, anticipate a loud noise when I show them a, fl a fluffy animal, they start crying without the noise at all. They just are shown the uh, uh, animal and then they'll start crying automatically because they know uh, something bad is coming, essentially, right? I see this with my son, too. If we put him down in his little uh, little high chair thing, he knows that we're going to be feeding him food, and he doesn't always like the food. So if you put him down, uh, he might get fussy. He usually does. He usually starts grunting, um, and then my wife's taught him some sign language, too. Uh, so he does the, uh, he knows the, the all done thing. So it's, it's so funny. Uh, if you put him in something that he's got a negative association with, like this uh, food chair, because he doesn't always like the food, and he doesn't want to, he'll be like, Ugh, and he'll just start going like this as soon as you put him down. It's like, no, buddy, sorry. You know, to eat first. All right, but uh, anyways, that was more early on. We, we found foods that he likes better now, so, but before, he didn't like the first rounds of food he got, so we put him in there, he'd be like, he'd just start fussing and be like, I'm all done. It's like, no, buddy, you just sat down. Uh, just because you do this doesn't mean we pick you up, up automatically. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, so that's, that's what association is. So that's called classical conditioning. Did I write that up already? I did not. So classical conditioning is just associations, automatic uh, uh, responses that are that are conditioned. Classical conditioning. Nice. So those are automatic. All right. So uh, like the dog doesn't choose to salivate uh, when they uh, uh, smell the food, uh, but then um, I take that unconditioned response and I attach it to uh, what was a previously neutral stimulus and to make that association, 
and then the uh, response is conditioned uh, to a different stimulus. Uh, another example would be, maybe if you know I'm gonna do it, you wouldn't, but if I walked up to you and then went right in your face, like with, with my hand or whatever, right up to your uh, eyes, what do you do automatically? Oh. You, you flinch, right, You're, you close your, you shut your eyelids and, and move your face back. It's automatic, all right? Uh, that's an example of something that's uh, an automatic association, because you know if something's coming at you, uh, you're gonna close your eyes because you're, you're anticipating the hit. And you need to experience it, by the way, babies do that. Um, uh, but uh, you could perhaps learn that, uh, like if I, if I make a, this is a weird example, but if I make a noise, and then every time after I make that noise, I go like that to your face, you're eventually gonna know that um, I'm not gonna actually hit you in the face, then you wouldn't be flinching at least not as much, because uh, you would know you'd make that association with the sound uh, and the uh, stimulus. So, um, yeah, that's, that's classical conditioning. So you're just training automatic responses uh, via association. Do you understand that one? Okay, and we'll, we'll talk more about what's different between that and uh, opera conditioning after the break.